Hi, this is Phil Newman. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Longevity Technology, and I'm delighted to say that we're going to be speaking with one of the uh, other speakers at October's Rejuvenation Startup Summit in Berlin, the entrepreneur and investor Christian Angermeyer. Uh, he's a strong supporter of the longevity sector through his uh, peer on investment group and his platform technology companies, which include uh, both Cambrian and Rejuveron. So welcome, Christian. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Well, it's great to, to have you and uh, uh, to have some time with you to, to discuss some of the uh, very exciting work that you're involved with. Now, I know that uh, Apiron invests in life sciences, fintech, crypto, future tech. Um, but why is uh, longevity such a key investment area for you? Um, first of all, it's always in a, in a friendly, I need a better word for it, but in a friendly way, it's a little bit of egoistic because obviously I want to live as long as possible in a, in a very healthy uh, and happy state. So I'm really doing it primarily for myself. Um, and then also it meaning, so, so years ago, like I look back, uh, I was thinking about biotech. And again, as you said, we do sort of the whole range of biotech investments, but like then what is what every single person really, really wants and hundred percent of, of any human being, like, so hundred percent total addressable market, it is to be happy and healthy. And once you're happy and healthy, you want to enjoy this life uh, for very long. So, so practically, if we figure out these two things, happiness and, and health, yeah, these will be, from my point of view, some of the biggest companies uh, in the world because the market is automatically there. So I started a company first, which is called uh, Atai Life Sciences, where we're bringing a focus on bringing psychedelics back into the medical realm um, as a treatment for various mental health issues. So that's sort of the happiness part. And then I was actually looking around because like I was always fascinated with, let's say, living forever or living very long. Um, and there were people, very important people, like both talking about it um, and sort of promoting it. But my feeling was back then in 2016, 17, I didn't find really like legit biotech companies who really raise the money like because it's one thing to talk about the possibility but then it's the same what i always say about psychedelics because people are like oh psychedelics are around since a long time but like yes but to bring them through medical trials you need hundreds of millions you need a sort of commercial plan you need the team whatever and that i had the feeling back then um uh, was missing so i didn't find companies which had sort of both big ambition to cure uh, ultimately aging, but also had the setup to be successful in an FDA framework, which is from my point of view, the only framework we can, we can discuss it if the framework is proper or if you would like to change it, but that's a long shot yeah, uh, because that needs political change. So I was like, I, because they weren't there, I want to set it up. Yeah, and this led to the sort of creation of Rejuveron and Cambrian, yeah, uh, which are doing really well and hopefully um, contributing to that sort of longevity effort. Very good, Christian. So let's talk about um, the fact that obviously there is now a very interesting pipeline of uh, biotech happening in the space. Uh, our definition of longevity does actually go outside of pure play biotech. But what are the areas of uh, longevity technology and development that most excite you at the moment? It's a broad question. I mean, first, by the way, where you write, you could say even that is sort of the very broad definition. Every biotech company is somehow longevity because if you don't die of something, yeah, uh, you're going to live longer. Yeah. So, so it's sort of my definition is more like really like what are medical drugs? So we're very focused on the on the sort of therapeutic side, which do either or or both. Yeah, I really dramatically improve the um, sort of the, the quality of life because let's let's start there. Like if we would live still just till 85 but we would all be like 30, 40 till 85. And then we break down, there would already be a massive improvement for ourselves, but also for the healthcare system and for the for everybody, because like that's where the problem started 50 uh, practically. But then also secondly, where you can push sort of uh, life expectancy. Um, meaning, and we, uh, a colleague of mine, um, Professor Manuel Serrano, um, who is uh, one of the key people at Rejuveron, he coined in his book, like I think it was 2014, very early, 13. Uh, uh, he was actually the guy who invented these nine hallmarks um, of age, or invented, who, who coined the term, or how you would say, like who created the term nine hallmarks uh, of aging. Um, and so we try in both companies, Rejuveron and Cambrian, to really address all uh, nine hallmarks of aging, just because like at the end, you will have to 
find solutions uh, for all of them. So I don't have a particular where I'm like, me. there's so many like cool um, uh, development. I'm also not a scientist, so I'm always trying on podcasts not to go too deep into science because then I might sound foolish. So my colleagues, can, but like we will be focusing on the, on the, on the broad spectrum. So uh, what do you see, you mentioned the FDA earlier, Christian, what do you see are the biggest challenges that uh, face uh, investment in the rejuvenation and longevity sector at the moment? So we, we're seeing activity growing, but there are still challenges out there. What, what do you see every day? Well, it's getting dramatically better. I mean, what is true is that uh, one of the big sort of still holdbacks is that the, the term aging in itself yeah, uh, and ultimately dying is not recognized as a disease. So if you show up at the FDA and you would have the, the, the wonder drug, um, which you claim whatever prolongs life very long, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely most, it's very unlikely that you would be allowed to go ahead with a clinical trial, yeah? And even if you did, the endpoints would be really far out because like they would say, well, then show us in 20 years, like, yeah, what changed? And so if it's not financeable, so, so, so there is two things. The one is like we need to lobby, yeah. And my colleagues uh, James Pyer, Matthias uh, Steger from Retriever and others formed this association to lobby to say we need to indeed get aging and um, dying itself to be recognized as a disease. But at the same time, we must sort of define biomarkers with the FDA, which allow sort of reasonable, reasonable in terms of financing and time horizon, reasonable clinical trials to be designed to prove any thesis uh, we bring forward. So these are the two intertwined sort of themes, like A, recognize it, but also like recognize it and sort of uh, or, or get the framework right. So in order to really do trials there. So absolutely. And we all know that um, age is a key indicator for uh, many diseases of aging. Um, and, and obviously, lifespan is a very important part of what we were talking about earlier. Would you find yourself investing in um, biomarker and diagnostics companies or are you purely purely focused on biotech? No, we're in. Well, that's for us belongs to biotech. So we definitely would look at it. So uh, let's talk about your your work with uh, uh, David Sinclair and Peter Atira. Um, you obviously uh, did your SPAC a few few months back, probably over a year ago now, perhaps. Oh yes, more than a year. Ago. Yeah, February yeah, two hundred million. Yeah. yeah. So so that was two hundred million. So perhaps uh, can you tell us what you're able to do with that money? What's your plan? Is there anything you could share with us today? Well, no details, obviously, because it's a public company. However, like, I think it's a broad biotech spec. So while we have Peter Atia and um, David Sinclair, like two very like, longevity famous people on board, like technically it's a, it's a biotech spec. So we're looking at the whole, um, at the whole uh, spectrum. Um, we haven't done a deal yet, but for a reason, because I guess that most viewers here will know like biotech markets were awful. Yeah, uh, I think, for the wrong, of, uh, it was it was wrong for investors to sort of hammer biotech that much. So, on, on, so at the moment, I think biotech in general is offering one of the most uh, amazing uh, investment opportunities. But because we saw that markets are, a, were awful and were getting worse over the last twelve months, we didn't do a deal because inherently everything we would have done would most likely have been been overpriced. So, so we still have like nine months uh, to go or seven months. Yeah, and now it's actually very interesting. Um, to find uh, to find a deal, so I, I'm very, very confident that we're going to do a deal before our sort of deadline uh, expires. And obviously now we would uh, we would do a deal in a very very sort of positive environment for a buyer, yeah, which is back is like sort of because valuations have been so hammered. Yeah, that's great, Chris. We'll, we'll watch this space uh, with uh, anticipation. So just talking about the wider markets and a lot of the correction that's been happening in the marketplace. Uh, we, we see that actually the uh, the appetite for longevity deals is still is still there. Uh, valuations are changing, uh, but you're at the front line of this stuff as a very seasoned and uh, leading investor. How do you feel about what's going on in the biotech market and how that relates to broadly biotech, but also the longevity biotechs? It, okay, so my personal view again, like sort of, it's a little bit of biased view because I'm in biotech, but like. Yeah, but like I think, meaning if you look at the very big picture, what happens? Like interest rates are going up, yeah, um, and that sort of warrants a little bit of a correction in sectors which are very sensitive to interest rates because of the 
the nature of a DCF model. So if you do a discounted cash flow model, obviously companies whose cash flow is very far in the future, yeah? so early stage biotech practically, um, which maybe is 10 years away, eight years away, 12 years away, whatever, from, from any cash flow, sort of there, if you add one or 2% or even 3%, to the annual discount rate, yeah. So that hurts the most. So practically, that's but it's a simple, banal uh, truth. Um, however, let's start. There. Like, I think the correction was way too. But this is always how corrections are. So I would say, looking back, maybe biotech should have gone thirty percent or something. So some correction was completely fair, yeah. But what then happens, especially in kind of niche market, and we shouldn't forget, biotech is not sort of there are maybe I don't know. Hundred specialized funds, but not thousands. Yeah. So, um, and and yes, there was written, but like it's still fairly compared to other bigger sectors. It's a fairly small community. And what happened because people were leveraged, their yeah, funds were leveraged. Like sort of the correction. So the first part of the correction was sort of fair, but then a correction if it's still too steep or too too, too quick and whatever, it sort of turns into a a, a vicious circle. Because then you have all the things like fund liquidations, yeah, and people get liquidated and whatever, and and and, and people get overly panicky, whatever. So I think a big part of the of the correction then after the first part were is sort of more like panic and and all of that. That is also the buying opportunity, obviously. But then and we see it already. I don't know when the interview comes out, but we see already that it's sort of uh, now we're in mid of August that it's bouncing, um, uh, it's bouncing back, and I definitely think we found the bottom. Um, so that's one thing. So there was this, as we might have also, because we should also forget biotech came from one of the best booms. So this came together like correction. It was at the top, but now sort of the pendulum swaying in the other direction. And I think now is the time to buy. Second, but that's my personal opinion. Yeah, I think interest rates will not go up as much as people fear. Yeah, because people forget, meaning that the pessimists are like, oh, this is like in the 70s and we're going to have a prolonged yeah, um, a time of inflation and stagflation, whatever. But I think the 70s are not comparable to where we're now. Yeah, we have now all the sort of technology, like the, the wheels are turning quicker. And I think that uh, on the supply side, we will way quicker see adjustments. Yeah, and I actually think I can't tell you when, but I deeply believe within the next years, not decades, within the next years, we actually gonna go back into that sort of deflationary cycle. Because I believe that the big forces at work in our economy are rather deflationary. Yeah, um, that would be sort of full swing back. The only thing which is against it is like, how bad will the geopolitical rewiring of the of the value of the production chains be? Because that is very inflationary. So maybe that sort of balances it out and we have a normalized inflation. But, but don't forget, like, I, I remember like well, 2015 or whatever, people were super worried about having deflation. Yeah, so so uh, inflation of 2% or whatever would be healthy. So, and I think that's where we're going to go. And then actually all is back and sort of um, risk on for for things like biotech. Well, that's fascinating to hear, Christian. I'm delighted to think you feel we've, uh, we've hit the bottom. What about the next 12 months then? Are there any particular areas of longevity that uh, you'll be looking out for either as a, as a personal investor or through your platforms? No, I think we're not going, we're very much going bottom, uh, bottom up, meaning like which opportunities are we seeing? Like, obviously, do they fit in our, in our framework? But I already told you, like, we going to go for the whole range of uh, nine hormones of aging like and then it's about the opportunity about valuations actually at the moment we want to do deals because like yeah um uh, valuations are comparably we believe low yeah and we're going to think it's going up well wonderful christian and we're going to be meeting um everybody in uh, in october at the uh, rejuvenation startup My summit country. yeah so looking forward to, to seeing you there and obviously learning a little bit more about what you've done since we spoke now. And it sounds like uh, things are starting to pick up and move quite fast. Cool. With pleasure. Great. Well, thanks for joining us today, Christian, and uh, see you in October. See you in October.